Gentlemen of the jury, you are the judges of the evidence to be laid before you. The famous jury trials, dramatizations of cases taken from actual court history. The names of persons and places have been altered to protect the identity of those concerned. The State versus Polly Conrad. It was in a large New England shipping port several years ago that Polly Conrad was placed on trial for her life, charged with the murder of a sea captain with whom for five years she had lived as man and wife. The case is particularly famous because it was one of the first times in history that a woman lawyer took part in a murder trial. Herbert Polly Conrad went on trial for her life. She entrusted her defense to a woman, Miss Mary Goodrich. Together they listened in tense concentration as the district attorney opened the case for the prosecution with his speech to the jury. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we will prove to you that the defendant, that woman sitting over there, has committed one of the most calculating and cold-blooded crimes which has ever been perpetrated in this community. Uh, I do not refer to the determined-looking young lady wearing glasses who is sitting at the same table. Her crime is so far to forget her sex as to study for the bar and to take up the practice of criminal law with all the necessary but unpleasant and degrading associations with criminals which such a career implies and which is far better be left for a man. Your Honor, Mr. I object. The Honorable District Attorney is deliberately setting out to prejudice the jury against me with its narrow-minded tirade. Perhaps I am narrow-minded, Your Honor. I would certainly hate to see my daughter take up a career which brought her into constant contact with thieves and murderers. Your Honor! Is Mr. Roberts' daughter of any relevance to this case? Your Honor! Order! Order! That's quite enough of this from both of you. Go ahead, Mr. Roberts. That woman there, the defendant, not her so-called attorney... Mr. Roberts, I do not want a repetition of this bad-mannered exhibition. That woman, the defendant, is a woman of low moral character, or better, of no morals at all. We will prove to you that she went to live with the man she was to murder, Captain Sherwood, while he was still married, allowed him to feed and clothe her, and keep a roof over her head, accepting his hard-earned money. Captain Sherwood made a will, leaving his life savings amounting to nearly $10,000 to this woman. But a few months ago, he became ashamed of his life with her. He planned upon obtaining a divorce from his wife from whom he had been long separated to marry a fine, upright girl, and he resolved to change his will. And when the defendant realized that she was going to be cut out of that will and lose everything, he shot the man who loved and supported her for years. That is the case we will prove to you. I call as my first witness, Kenneth Morley. Kenneth Morley? Kenneth Morley? <coughs> Kenneth Morley, take the stand. You found me swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God. I do. Your occupation. I am a patrolman, third precinct. Your beat takes you past the tenement house where the defendant lives? Sure, and it does. Will you tell the jury what you did on the afternoon of August 17th last? Ask him if he remembers the date first. I can conduct my case without any help from you, Miss Goodrich. I doubt it. Your Honor, will you please explain the law to my worthy colleague? Your Honor, order. There is no way to address the bench, Miss Goodrich. I make a formal objection to his question, then. Officer, do you remember August the 17th? Sure, and I ain't likely to forget it, Your Honor. You go ahead from there, Mr. Roberts. Tell the jury what happened, please. Well, nothing much happened until about half the three. Then one of the tenants that lives in the same building as the defendant comes running off to me and tells me there's been a murder. So off I go to investigate. I object to the word murder. That's what the fellow says. What the fellow says is hearsay and incompetent. Your Honor, objection to strange. Try it out. Did you then go up to the defendant's apartment, officer? Uh, yes. When I got there, Captain Sherwood was sitting in an armchair. The Conrad woman was on her knees beside him. He was unconscious and bleeding from a wound over his heart. What did the defendant do? 
Well, she says, I done it. I killed him. And when I asked why, she says, it was leaving me for another woman he was, so I shot him. Did the defendant tell you a different story later? Oh, yes. When I questioned her again down at the station, she says she shot Captain Sherwood accidentally. Yeah? She says Captain Sherwood said he was leaving her. And so she got out his pistol to try and stop him. And then the captain tried to take the pistol away from her. She says he forced her to her knees, and then the pistol went off. Captain staggered back, shot. Officer, there are a number of exhibits here I would like you to identify. First, I show you... The pistol and the suitcase belonging to Captain Sherwood were put into evidence. And then Miss Goodrich began her cross-examination. Officer, you say you found the defendant, Miss Conrad, on her knees beside Captain Sherwood. Uh, yes, ma'am. Was she saying anything? Well, yes, ma'am. She was asked to tell him to be brave, and the doctor was coming any minute, and... He was going to be all right. Of course, seeing as he was unconscious, it wasn't doing him no good. And what was Miss Conrad's manner? Oh, was squealing like a banshee she was. She seemed very upset. Yes, ma'am. In short, didn't she act as though she'd lost someone she loved and not someone she hated? I object. Counsel's leading the witness. First thing. And Miss Conrad did appear to be grief-stricken. Objection. Leading question. Why don't you go back up on your law? There's nothing wrong with a leading question on cross-examination. Miss Goodrich, the court will make the rulings here, not you. Haven't I the right to make proper arguments? Certainly, but make them to me, not to Mr. Roberts. I overrule the objection. The witness will answer. Uh, what was the question? Did Miss Conrad seem to be grief-stricken when you saw her? Yes, ma'am, she did. That's all. Call Dr. Marcus Winfield. Marcus Winfield. Marcus Winfield. Dr. Winfield, did you perform the autopsy on the body of Captain Christopher Sherwood? Yes, sir, I did. What did you determine as the cause of his death? He died as the result of a bullet which penetrated the heart and rings downward through the viscera, puncturing the intestinal fold some six or seven times. The bullet rings downward, you say? Uh, yes. Would it have been possible for anyone to have fired that bullet from a kneeling position and inflict such a wound? Quite impossible. Well, then the course of the bullet would have been upwards, not down. But assuming that a person of the build of Captain Sherwood was sitting in a chair and the bullet was fired by another person standing over him, what would be the course of that bullet? Precisely the same as the actual bullet made. Doctor, where and in what position was Captain Sherwood when you first saw his body? Well, the body was slumped over in a sitting position in an armchair in his apartment. One more question, Doctor. Would a woman of Miss Conrad's size have been able to inflict the wound you saw if both she and Captain Sherwood were standing? Well, it would have been most difficult. In fact, I would say that there was but one possible position to answer the conditions. Captain Sherwood must have been sitting and Miss Conrad standing over him. Thank you, Doctor. You can take the witness, Miss Goodrich. No question. Call Edward Sinclair. Edward Sinclair. Edward Sinclair. You were Captain Sherwood's lawyer. Oh, well, wait, Captain Sherwood. Yeah. Did you make out a will for him some two years ago? My dad. Will you tell the jury what the provisions of that will were? There was only one provision. The late Captain Sherwood left his entire estate to a woman named Polly Conrad. The defendant? I presume so. Did the late Captain Sherwood recently indicate to you his intention to change that will? Yes. Yeah. What precisely did he say? Well, uh, he said with various expedients, which I trust I will not be required to repeat here, that Miss Conrad was going to be shown. Shown what? Just uh, shown. I'll show her were his exact words. And the next day he was shot. Yes. Do you know the value of the estate left by Captain Sherwood? Yes. It amounted of the last outing to ten thousand two hundred dollars and sixty three cents. That is in security. His other property was, I believe, of very little value. Thank you. Your witness. No question. Called Sarah Cat. Neighbors of Polly Conrad were called to testify to her home life with Captain Sherwood. 
By implication, the moral character of the defendant was torn to shreds. Then the prosecution rested, leaving little doubt in the minds of the spectators that Polly Conrad would speedily be found guilty. We will continue with this unique case in just a moment. To famous jury trials on KNBR 68. And now we take you back to the courtroom where defense lawyer Mary Goodrich opened the case for the defendant. Your Honor, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, Miss Conrad has been presented to you as a woman of low moral character who murdered a man for his money. I am going to prove to you that Miss Conrad is a woman of the highest moral character. And that the killing of Captain Sherwood was justifiable homicide. I call the defendant to the stand. Polly Conrad. Polly Conrad. Polly Conrad, take the stand, please. You can only swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God. I do. How old are you, Polly? I'm 25. You were 20 when you first met Captain Sherwood? Yes. Where did you meet him? At my home. Will you tell the jury the circumstances of that meeting? Oh, I lived on a farm with my family up near the Berkshire. It was a Sunday night. My folks had gone to church. I was alone in the house. It came on to rain. It was one of the worst thunderstorms I've ever seen, and I was scared of being alone in the house. And then suddenly, there came a loud knocking on the back door, and I... Oh, give me a jacket and I'll hang it up to dry. Dirty, ma'am. And the bird went through. That powerful witch walking up here from the road. What happened to you? That tire. Came up here to see if anyone could help me fix it. I'm a thief there, man. Listen, know nothing about them contraptions. Don't trust them. Borrowed this one from a friend. That was your first meeting? Yes. He sat there by the stove talking, and when Paul and Ma came home, it was still rainy and quite late, so they asked him to stay the night. And did he? Yes. Next morning, he asked Pa if he could stay on as a boarder. How long did he remain? Nearly two weeks. And when he left, I left with him. How did that happen? I think I fell in love with him on the first night. He told me he was already married. He hadn't been living with his wife for years, and she was going to divorce him to marry someone else. That made no difference to you. He promised he'd come and get me when he was free, but I was afraid, afraid he'd meet someone else and forget me. I was afraid he'd never come back to me, so I went with him. I told myself we loved each other, and I thought I'd die if I lost him. Were you happy with him? Yes, terribly happy. For a little while. Then I began to find out what Chris was really like. Would you please explain that, Polly? Well, when a voyage was over, he'd get drunk and spend all his money going with other women. You didn't leave him? No, I loved him. At first, I was so hurt and heartsick, I didn't think I could bear to go on. And then gradually, I came to understand that he really did need me. He called me the anchor to Wingwood, and that's what I was. He needed me to take care of him, to run his home, to keep him out of scrapes, to save his money. He didn't thank me for doing any of those things. Generally, he cursed me instead. And were you able to make him save his money? 
Yes. Did he have any money saved when you first went to live with him? No, not a cent. But we lived very cheaply, and I managed to put away quite a lot for him. Miss Conrad, will you tell the jury about the events which led up to the shooting? Well, about three weeks before... Before Chris was shot, he met a girl. Oh, a silly young girl, pretty. That's like I was, I guess. Chris fell madly in love with her. Finally, he persuaded her to go to New York with him, and he promised her he'd marry her there. I went to see the girl. She was a pretty rabbit brain who came hopelessly in love. She thought I was trying to break up the match out of jealousy, and she wouldn't listen to a word of warning or anything I had to say. She told me she understood Chris, and I didn't. What did you do? After seeing the girl, I made up my mind I couldn't let Chris do this. If she'd been a hard-boiled type or someone who could take care of herself, I might not have interfered. But this little thing, she, she was a sweet little girl, still in her teens. Did you try and dissuade Captain Sherwood from going away with this girl? Yes. I made the first real scenes I'd made for years. Once he got so angry, he struck me. Finally, he announced he was leaving me. <laughs> that night, he went out and got drunk. He didn't come back until the next afternoon, and then he began packing his things. Threw them into a couple of bags and started to leave. I asked him where he was going, and he said, I'm taking my turf away from that tongue of yours, see? I'm not coming back, see? We're through. Okay. Chris, are you really going to take that girl to New York? You bet I am. No. No, you can't, Chris. You can't. That's my pistol. Put it down. Chris, if you try to leave this room, I'm going to shoot you. I mean it. You better give that to me, Polly. Give it to me. No. Give it to me. You're hurting me. Chris, no. <laughs> It's all right, Mickey. It's all right. Help me to the chair. Chris, yes. I'll call the doctor, Chris. Polly. Yes, yes, Chris. It was always you, Polly. Always you I loved. The others I... I didn't care not about anyone but you. I had to come back to you, Polly. I was coming back. <laughs> Let me sleep now, maybe. Let me sleep. Let me. She died there in my arms before the doctor came. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Conrad. You're with us. <clears throat> Miss Conrad, you had no legal hold over Captain Sherwood, did you? No. No claim on that money you had carefully hoarded away in the bank? It was his money. And since Captain Sherwood intended to change his will, you would not inherit that money? No. I hadn't thought about that. Really? Miss Conrad, did Captain Sherwood ever tell you in so many words that he did not intend to marry this other girl? Well, when he was... Answer the question, yes or no. Answer it any way you like, Polly. I said answer it, yes or no. Your Honor, the district attorney seems to be under the impression that he can force the witness to answer yes or no. There isn't any law to that effect, and there never has been. Well, what? Yes? Quite right. You can't dictate the witness's testimony, Counselor. Captain Sherwood did plan to marry this girl, didn't he? No. He planned to marry her and disinherit you. And that's why you took his pistol and crept up on that unsuspecting man and shot him through the heart as he sat in his armchair. Isn't it? No, no, it isn't true. I didn't, I didn't. That's all. Polly Conrad stepped down, and defense lawyer Mary Goodrich called a medical expert, Dr. Robert J. Dr. J., who had examined the body, opposed the previous medical testimony and supported his contention with the aid of charts. And in your considered opinion, Doctor, 
Those rooms were not made when Captain Sir was either standing or sitting. I know. I believe it quite impossible. In what position would you say he was when he was shot? He was stooping over. <laughs> On what do you base that conclusion? Well, as you see from this chart, the intestines have been punctured nine times by a single bullet. And the only way that this could have occurred is for the viscera to have been folded over upon themselves as would occur if the deceased had been stooping over. Polly, will you take this crystal, please? I object. Overruled. What do you want me to do? Hold the pistol as you did when Captain Sherwood was shot. Right, sir? Yes. Now, I force you to your knees. Now, get down on your knees. I'm trying to get the pistol away from you. I have to bend way over because you are kneeling. Doctor, in this position that I am illustrating now, would a bullet fired from the gun the defendant is holding cause wounds similar to those near exhibit? That is the only position in which such wounds could be made. Thank you, Doctor. Take the witness. The district attorney was unable to shape the testimony of Dr. Jerry. And with the calling of rebuttal witnesses, the taking of testimony came to an end. Then the defense lawyer began her summation to the jury. Your Honor, ladies and gentlemen of the jury... I think that you must all feel, as I feel, humble in the presence of this true and loyal woman. This woman, whose love stands out as a burning beacon of faithful devotion, as an inspiration to all of us. And her final action proves, as nothing else could, the goodness and nobility which had sustained her through all the hard years of her life with Captain Sherwood. For she would not permit him to do to another what he had done to her. Do it to a pathetic little girl, pitifully in love, and utterly incapable of surviving the soul-shattering disillusionment that Sherrod would have brought her. It was to prevent this that Polly Conrad threatened Christopher Sherwood with a pistol. He tried to take that pistol away from her, and in the struggle the pistol was fired, and Christopher Sherwood killed. Accidentally it went off. Accidentally, it was pointed at Captain Sherwood at that moment. The shooting was entirely accidental. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, he is not guilty. The prosecution will sum up. Your Honor, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, let us forget the female hysteria and look at the plain hard facts of this case. Polly Conrad went to live with Christopher Sherwood without benefit of clergy. That fact is not an example of bright courage and devotion, as the Honorable Miss Goodrich truly complained. Miss Conrad succeeds in having herself named beneficiary in Captain Sherwood's will. Everything is peaceful until the captain falls in love. He had won the pure love of a young girl, and it is perfectly plain that he intended to marry her. Now, what was the defendant's position at this point? He was about to lose the man who had supported her. But worse, he was about to change his will so that Polly Conrad would not inherit a penny of his money. Polly Conrad had to act and act quickly. And that's what she did. Polly Conrad shot Christopher Sherwood for his money and for no other reason. Her action was as merciless, brutal, cold-blooded, and as mercenary a crime as would shame the most hardened criminal. She is guilty, ladies and gentlemen. Guilty of murder in the first degree. How would you have judged Polly Conrad? A brutal woman who shot her lover for his money? Or an honest and sincere woman enmeshed in an ugly situation that led to accidental tragedy? We will bring you the verdict of the jury in just a moment. Look, if you've got no complaints about your car's last tune-up, stick with the guys you're going to. And they're probably pretty good. But if you're not happy, why not switch to Goodyear? And when we do a tune-up, we do it right the first time. We won't waste your time or your money, which may be why every month over 50,000 new customers are referred to Goodyear by satisfied customers. And so if you need a tune-up, come to Goodyear. We want to be your auto service center for good. 
And now the verdict in tonight's famous jury trials on KNBR 68. And now we take you back to the courtroom where the jury, after being out only three hours, had returned, prepared to deliver their verdict. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, have you reached the verdict? We have, Your Honor. How do you find? We find the defendant, Polly Conrad, not guilty. <laughs> Vindicated with a verdict of not guilty, the judge apparently shared the jury's sympathy with the defendant because Polly Conrad returned to the home of her parents where she succeeded in living down her past and a few years later was happily married. And so ended the twisted story of Christopher Sherwood and Polly Conrad. Famous jury trials, the drama of the court drawn from actual courtroom cases. This is a Grace Gibson radio production directed by Lawrence H. Settle.